nobody was more shocked than I was when I was arrested. I had no intention, I had no reason to come back. I had a good job, my own home. I had no reason to um, go on the fiddle, as I say, none at all. When you go out and you, and you steal something, it's a marvellous feeling. You just don't think about getting caught. And when you do get caught, then of course, the bottoms fell out of your world. Every morning I wake up in this prison and I think to myself, Christ, what am I doing in here again? You know, it's just just something that I can't believe. I, I still can't believe it. I've been here a year and nine months and I still can't take it in that here I am in prison for five years again. Well, I knew that one day I was going to get caught, so I was prepared to take the rap for it. The crime I was doing, I was stealing cars. I was buying write-off cars so I could get the logbooks and then stealing a car to suit the logbooks. This is the first time I've done checks. Before I just done breaking and entering and silly things. But now I think about it, I wonder how I had the nerve to walk into a place and sign a check and hand it over. At the time you feel big, you know, as if you own the world sort of thing, but you don't. In the beginning, I used to think, this isn't me, I'm not here, it hasn't happened. And when the, I could hear the tumbrils roll when the judge was summing up, and I knew I had a sentence coming, I was thinking, this isn't true. And I didn't faint, I'm not a fainter, but his, his red robe and the wig and he sort of swam. I thought, this is a bad movie, I'm going to walk out. In this country, not many women are sent to prison. There are about a thousand serving sentences against 40,000 men. What happens to them? Australia refused to take any more transported convicts. That was in 1852. At the time, neighbours objected because Holloway was then a desirable suburb. So the authorities designed the prison to look like a medieval castle. brought here today are professional criminals. Hardly any belong to gangs, and almost all of them are young. Get yourself undressed, take everything off, and make it be dressed. Mm -hmm. Sandra, age 27, the mother of a three-month-old baby, is separated from her husband. She hasn't seen her parents for six years. Her sentence, three months for soliciting. Yes. Sure. I'm just pregnant. 
Tiffany, and I need to wear a nice little tool, chest travel, and pop travel. No. No, that's all. I know I've got to do it. I'll give you a hand. I'm going to do it. 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 I'm the search, and every new prisoner must face up to it, is for nits, or scabies, or pubic lice, or drugs, or tobacco. It's regulation number 39 in the prison rules laid down by the Home Office. A prisoner shall be searched in as seemly a manner as is consistent with discovering anything concealed. Now then, are you married or single? I'm separated. Have you had any children? One. Now then, is the child adopted in care, or who's looking after her? Yeah, um, I have somebody to look after her, a lady that looks after her during the evenings for me. I see, and she's looking after you this minute yeah. while you're here? Yeah. And she's a friend of yours, is she? She's um, a foster mother. I see. So it, it is in care, and mm. you're quite satisfied about that? Yeah. The child being at home. How old is the child? Three months. This is your week. That's right. Right. One brown wig. Black handbag and a brown purse. Is this your barrow or is it mine? The first day is always the worst, and for Sandra, there's the worry about her baby. I've got to ask some questions to find out whether she will be able to come and see me or I would go and see her. I think it would upset me too much if I did see her anyway. I think I'd rather leave it until I go out. And I can cry as much as I want to when I get home. Is that what you're afraid of? I'm frightened of that, yeah. So last night I was crying every time I thought of her, so I'm sure it would upset me if I did see her and she'd have to go again. But why would you be afraid of showing your emotions over your baby? I don't, I don't really know. Stubbornness or what? Well, I don't want to show myself up here or what? I don't know. Or in front of the other prisoners? Yeah. Because it's not a very nice thing to do. It's um, upset yourself all the time, otherwise you get a name for yourself. So that's so what I'd seen. So I'd rather people not see my emotions in here, just keep them to myself. Another day starts.
number 21. The food provided shall be wholesome, nutritious, well prepared and served, reasonably varied and sufficient in quantity. Number two, order and discipline shall be maintained with firmness but with no more restriction than is required for safe custody and a well-ordered community life. Barbara. Give us your name. Give us your name. Good morning, Barbara. Now, Barbara, you understand that yesterday you were further remanded till the 31st of December, don't yes. you? Is there anything you want At the reception and discharge board, a prisoner may still be as dazed by the penal system rules the day she's ready to go out as she was when she first came in. Sit down, Give me your card. Give your name to the governor. Thank you. Good morning, Elsie. Now, you've been discharged on Monday, aren't you? Yes. Can I ask if you've applied for the discharge grant, Elsie? Sorry, I don't understand. Did you apply for the discharge grant? Or perhaps you didn't need no, it? No, You haven't, I see. But you didn't, in fact, need it, did you? I don't think so. No. Um, this is, in fact, the first time you've ever been in prison, Elsie, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. And, of course, from our point of view, we certainly hope that you'll, we'll never see you here again. We do hope all goes well with you. Is there anything you'd like to ask us this morning before you go? No. That's it. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Good morning. Your Give me your Good morning, Good morning, Sandra. Come and sit down. Now, you've been transferred to us, Sandra, haven't you? For your appeal hearing. And is there anything you'd like to ask us this morning, Sandra? Um, well, there's something about an appeal visit. Yes. Yeah. Okay. You'd like to ask us to arrange an appeal visit for you while you're here? Please. When is your appeal being heard? In time? Tuesday. On Tuesday. So we've got time to arrange that, haven't we? Um, have you written to your relatives about this? Uh, yes. So you have asked them to come? Yes. Well, that would be quite in order. We can certainly arrange that for you. Prison rule number one. The purpose of the training and treatment of convicted prisoners shall be to encourage and assist them to lead a good and useful life.
workshop where women prisoners make overalls for men prisoners. But once part of this room was the condemned cell. They knocked down the walls and gave it a lick of paint, but some of the prisoners remember the days when women were hanged in here. They, they converted it into a top class work. But it is the old condemned cell. There's uh, three holes in the roof where the gallows were, where I sit. But Ruth Ellis was the last one to get hung there. It's a weird atmosphere. It gives you a, a weird sensation. You feel all sick inside, so you try not to think about it. Many women aren't equipped for sustained and concentrated effort, but for Carol, age 27, intelligent and alert, there's prestige prison work. Tapestry chair covers by request, commissioned exclusively for West End stores and stately homes. When I got Nick Bird in my possession, a Rover 2000, um, a 2.4 Jag, and an Austin Cambridge estate. So they did me for those three motors. But those are all that they did me for. And then they did me for this protection, this demanding money with menaces. I pleaded guilty to everything they charged me with because I was guilty. I got caught red-handed. But so, when you were doing it, when you were involved in it, what are your feelings about the morality of it? What is morality? This is an individual thing. At that time, I was concerned about myself, how much money I was going to make, and how easily I was going to make it. I didn't care about anyone else. I was completely ruthless. I don't feel like that anymore, but at that time, I did. Did you worry about being caught, about it all coming to an end? I didn't worry about it. I knew that it would happen. Why? I just knew you can only go on for so long. I was fully aware that one day I would go to prison for a long time. So that when I eventually got caught, I thought, well, I've had a good run. I'll do my bird. But the fear that you'd go to prison didn't deter you? The fear didn't deter me, no. Going around this prison, it doesn't seem to be such a bad place. Obviously, you've lost your freedom, but there seems to be a lot of happiness about it. Have you suffered as a result of being in prison? No, I haven't suffered at all. I moan sometimes, some days I get a bit fed up, but not often. Most of the time, I'm quite happy. I've done my sentence, it's never bothered me. Because prison is a state of mind. Most of these people go through their sentences, counting the days to when they're going out. But I've lived in prison. I've lived with two feet in here. I've completely lived prison. Everything that's going on and around me, I've joined into it, and that's been it. I haven't had one foot over the wall, you know? Now I think my spirit is leaving me, and it's sort of clambering over the wall. But um, it won't be long now, and I shall soon be out. But you've been in here some years now. Yes, I've been in over three years now. Carol, if I, can I say this? You're a young woman, and you're an attractive woman, and when you're outside, you must have had a lot of attention from men. Yeah. Do you miss men's company when you're in here? No, I don't think so, because when you're in prison for a time, you must, of necessity, form a, a lesbian relationship. Of necessity? Well, yes, I mean, you're going to have some outlet for your emotions rather than your, your physical needs. A lot of women wouldn't sympathize with you hearing you talk this way. A lot of women wouldn't be truthful then, would they? Because most of the women in Holloway have got some lesbian tendencies. I think that most women are bisexual. It's just a case of whether they meet the right person or not. So what is your own attitude towards it? Do you feel the rightness or the wrongness of it? I think it's quite right. I, to me, it's perfectly natural. I mean, love 
within a person is a capacity within themselves and to, to whom they direct it, as long as they direct it to somebody or something, it is good. It is something which must be let out because, I mean, if you stem it within yourself, it's just going to mash you up to pieces. People are doing short sentences, you know, you get your kicksters, you, what they call their boy girls, they come in and they, they dress up like men and they go around and they, what they call, pons, you know, take cigarettes, tobacco and that, you know, because it's the um, short demand and they seem to do very well, they make a good trade out of it. But I mean, quite a lot of lesbians, you would never realise that they were lesbians. Well, outside of prison, would you consider yourself a lesbian? No, I wouldn't consider myself a lesbian. I just consider myself a normal woman. <laughs> Prison rule number 28. A convicted prisoner shall be required to do useful work for not more than 10 hours a day, and arrangements should be made to allow prisoners to work where possible outside the cells and in association with one another. In single-sex communities, affections still grow. Among women prisoners, the relationships range from lesbianism to the more frequent schoolgirl crushes. don't offer work contracts to prisons readily, and when they do, the tasks can be childishly simple and boring, like packing pencils. Faced with two years of it for cashing dead checks, Jill, aged 22, hardly finds the sentence passing quickly or usefully. She's lonely, too. Her best friend's been moved to another wing. Sandy! Sandy! At one time we all used to be on the same wing together and we used to work together and then we all got separated and she went away to Portstall and now she's on a different wing, she's come back on a different wing. So the only time I get to, you know, talk to her is out of the window. So we talk to each other all the time, right? be, you know, dinner time and breakfast time and tea time and nearly all evening until the lights come out. You're shouting across there all the time? Yeah. <laughs> Gives a bit of a drag, you know, because my throat comes. Is it out, you know, gone all croaky now? When a woman is sent to prison, who do you feel suffers most? The people she leaves outside. Um, parents. I come from a little village. And my parents have to go to work in that village. My mother has to serve people in a shop in that village. A very well-to-do shop. And people to point at my mother and to say, there's Joe Cowell's mother, you're the one that was in, got two years, you know, for checks. That hurts me to think my parents come up every month to see me. Never in my life have they let me down. They've always been there, and they've always had some sort of something to give me, you know, and always been there to help. Jill, as I understand it, uh, you come from what's called a respectable family. Yes. My father used to work for Securicall, you know, take money around the banks. And before that, he worked at the post office. And my mother's, and they're both as straight as a die, you know. Have you ever worked out in your own mind what got you into trouble in the first place? Well, I think I had too much handed to me and too many things given to me. And my parents gave me too many material things that the more I got, the more I wanted. So I went out and, you know, nicked it. But one of the things that the officers say here is that crime is voluntary. Well, it is voluntary. You know, you don't have to do it. But if you're lazy, and I suppose in a way I am lazy, well, I am lazy because I won't work. And so I have to get my money somehow. I can't keep going to my parents and saying, look, Dad, I haven't got any money, give me ten pound. So I've got to get my money somehow, and this is how I get my money. But when you say that you won't work, you mean you won't ever work, you don't? Well, when, the, before I came in here, this was my attitude. Work, stupid people worked, you know, and I could never find a job when I was happy at, and I couldn't sit in a factory and do factory work. 
I could I can type, but I couldn't sit in an office and type because to me that was boredom. But what about prison itself? Has this done anything for you? You're locked up so much. You have time to think, and you think about where you went wrong and the problems that inside you have to cope with, whereas outside you can run away from them. And I think since being in prison, I have learned a lot more about how to cope with problems and where I went wrong outside. But in fact, you haven't exactly been a model prisoner, have no, you? No. You've I've been had... in almost every wing in the prison. Yes. I went on to E-Wing and I was chucked off for fighting. What happened then? Well, you get aggravation in the actual prison, you know. You're all locked in together, really, around a wall. And you can't get away from anything. And I wanted a shampoo, and I only had enough money to buy myself tobacco that week. And this chick, this girl, she said to me, I will give you a shampoo, Julia. And I said to her, I'll give you half of my half ounce tobacco for it. So that was fair enough, I gave her the tobacco. That evening, she was going to give me the shampoo. So when I asked her for it, she said, I've used it. So of course, that made me mad. I had a visit the next day, and I wanted to wash my hair. So I waited upstairs for her, and when she came up, I said to her, put your tray down. And she said, why? I said, because I'm going to hit you. And she ignored me. So I just banged the one. Aggravation over half a shampoo. But value is about to change when you only earn a few shillings a week and the shop opens once on payday. Ten, twelve and a penny. Want the bag? Yes, please. Next one. Mind you pull your socks up coming up tonight. You've got nine and a penny today. You've got your gun boots on and all. <laughs> Yeah. Are you not very cold today? Not cold now, but I was when I started. I'll have a pen then, thank you. <laughs> You've got 14 tea bags. 14 tea bags and a pound of sugar. Yeah. Well, two and three. Packages of uh, tobacco, you know, the usual. The usual. Old Hoban. Yeah. Old Holborn. Two papers. Yeah, one paper. And, and now a heat box of matches, yeah. and then I can get ten weights. Ten weights, that's it. He loves a heat box, Scottish. Here you are, Connie, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Supplies for a week on a tight budget, but you learn how to manage when you've been in Holloway for theft as many times as Muriel. Well, I pay ten pence for letters weekly, that's the two five penny stamps, and I buy half a pound of PGT, that's three and ten, and then I buy tobacco, and it leaves me with three or four cigarettes, and a box of matches, a couple of packets of papers. How long do they last you? What? The matches. Uh, uh, oh, last me a week. It can last me longer than a week, for really. One box. Yeah, I split them, you see. You can get four matches out of one, you know. Would you like me to show you? Mm -hmm. Get the match and the pin, put it on something hard, just press it in, like that. Take it down gently. That's two, right? And then you split it again, you split both parts again. But that doesn't have a stripe in it. Yeah. Well, Which piece do you want me to strike? This little tiny bit or that bit? Yes, I wouldn't wear today. Have you got a cigarette? Yeah, I've got a... Um, I've got a bag. I'll see if that, that's a bit dicey because the, um, the thing's short, the wood's short. So you get your finger on it like that. But you can hardly see the head. Oh, well done. <laughs> it's easy when you know how. You see, there's about 50 matches in there, so you get 200 lights. That way, splitting them into four. But what about this cigarette you've got? That's a tailor-made one, isn't it? Yeah, well, uh, uh, somebody just give me that, so I'm going to out it, and I'll make two fags out of that, you see. How do you mean? Okay, I'll show you. You see, you break it open like that. That's one bit for one bit. 
paper, fake paper. But you never taste it. Well, it's a smoke, isn't it? When, when, do you know, it's worse when there's none. Well, I suppose it's better than nothing, but... It is, definitely. Not much, is it? Yeah. See? When are you going to have that one, then? I'll have it now, I think. <laughs> You're it, being extravagant. Yeah, I am. Well, it was extravagant, really, like you not to, all right? It's all right. Does it taste of tobacco or paper? A bit of both, but you get used to the taste of paper. You get used to, uh, to it taste. You know what, on a Friday, when we get paid Friday morning, we smoke, we make great big thick roll-ups, you know, with the old old, but then we save that dog end and we make another roll-up with that dog end, and then the dog end of that, you make another roll-up with, so that's three smokes out of one fight. But what does it taste like in the end? Off smoke. It does. It does. It, <laughs> it does. It just tastes like that, honestly. It's bitter and horrible, you know. Well, why do you smoke it then? Well, I've got to smoke something. Look, you see, that's been smoked again and again and again, that, that bit there. But that's got cigarette tobacco in it, you see. But it, 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 it goes blacker and blacker and blacker till you get to the last cigarette, last dog end, and that's your last smoke then for the weed. And I have that then, about Thursday night. Do you smoke cigarettes like that? Do you roll your own when you're outside? No. I smoke big posh players perfectos when I'm out. I don't smoke that outside, do I? I, I wouldn't dream of that. I wouldn't entertain it. What about the other women who have uh, rooms you call them rooms, don't you? Yeah. Not yeah. cells. Bedrooms sounds nicer. <laughs> <laughs> what about those who have bedrooms which aren't as attractive as this? Is there any jealousy? Oh, well, on one incident, I had a couple of pictures um, uh, ripped up. They were just taken down and ripped up and left on the bed. Um, I have an idea who did it, but I, of course, one mustn't accuse, you see. But since then, they all try to get in here, you know, because I've got, always got plenty of tea. I buy half a pound of PG every week. There's one open and there's the rest in the caddy from the other one. You get a pint of milk a day. So, um, not bad, really. I get eggs on my diet every morning. <laughs> on your diet? Yeah, I, I've, I've been in Congress there. I've got an ulcer, so I get salads and eggs. You do know what? I've been and said that I've got an ulcer so that I get salads and eggs instead of potato and the yucky stuff, you know. Well, I've got long enough to do, haven't I? I might as well live right. But it, it is a nice window. I, you know, I had, um, there was a pigeon. I used to put bits of bread out. The birds used to come and sit on those bars outside. There are bars outside. You, don't, you just can't sit unless the window is open. And he used to drop it down there, and there was this dirty, scraggy old pigeon used to come every morning and every night. He's been coming for since I've been here. And last summer, he come with a lovely um, grey and brown pigeon and three young ones. They got himself married and got three kids from my thing. He likes a bit of cake, you know. And, mm, all right. He likes that. I like to feed birds, the birds, it's a pet, you know what I mean? Um, Does he have earphones there? Yeah, they plug in there. A lot of people might say that this doesn't remind them of prison. Yes, well they all do, you know, I've got five or six friends and they nip in and have you got the kettle on and shall I go and make a cup of tea and they all sit all over the bed and lounging all over everywhere. They say it's homely, but you see I've been here so long that I've I know that I was going to be here a fairly long time. So I bought the bedspread, bought the material, and made the curtain. That was a bit of cloth that was over for the cushion cover. I made it as nice as I could, you know. An uncharitable person might call it home from home. Mm, not me. It's nothing like my home. Nothing like it. 
It's nothing that mild. What about the pictures on the wall? Which, which are your most treasured ones? My mum. That's my most treasured one. And these are here? And I painted that picture. And I didn't put the Spanish lady on his feet because I knew he should walk. It's not complete, you see, so nobody will nick it. <laughs> That's why you haven't finished it. Yeah, I haven't put it on his feet because as soon as it gets feet, it'll walk. <laughs> Because they will steal p p pictures and things, you know. You laugh an awful lot. What's the good of crying? What good would come out of crying now, sitting here all... Mm, I hate this place. What's the good of that? He won't get me out, will he? But you've got years to do. Oh, thank you. Not years, only... I say a few months now. How long has it been fact? Well, I don't, I haven't got a date, you see. This is it. I'm an extended sentence. Really, if I do three years and four months, it's about July 1972. But I'm expecting parole, you see. So it could be any time. Any time. If I don't get it, well, they can't really make me do all that time, can they, really? Three years and four months, I've got to give you a chance sometime. Prison rule number two, subsection two. In the control of prisoners, officers shall seek to influence them through their own example and leadership and to enlist their willing cooperation. Senior prison officer Brenda Thornton, ex-RAF, knows how hard a prison sentence can hit a woman. Well, I think a lot of women don't realize that they've been sentenced until they get to Holloway. This is, this is a thing that I don't think they know they just hear a murmur, 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 and they come downstairs and sometimes they say to you, Miss, what did I get? And you say, you got four years imprisonment. And she'll say, oh. Now, three months later, that girl, she may have to book for the doctor. And he'll say, what's the matter with him? She'll say to him, I've just realised I've got four years imprisonment. And half of this doesn't sink. Now, that could be a worse part for a woman. It could be the ordeal of going through court. But most of the women say, they say, oh, miss, going through those prison doors and the big clang as the door's shut, they know then that they are cut off from the families, the outside world, the normal telephone, and things which we take for granted outside, using normal toothpaste, having a bar of soap, going out for a meal when you want it, sitting down and watching television when you want to, or sitting at home having a quiet drink. This is all finished. There's nothing of this now. But the other day, that while we were here, there was a girl shouting and screaming in that wing there, mm. going around, and the, suddenly the, uh, it's like panic stations, there's officers running from every direction. Mm. How do you deal with a situation like that? If you have a situation like that, that you've got to go down to a fight with a woman, by all means, members of staff stick together in this way. Because if I was in a fight and I was getting my head beaten in by an inmate, I would definitely want to know why my friends weren't there when I needed them, same as I would go if somebody else. Uh, is there that danger there. in your job of getting... There is a danger in it, yes, you never know. I mean, you might get some women who objects to uniform. You get a lot of women who do object to uniform. And there's no two ways about it. She hates you because you were in uniform. And you get one of these maybe very, very occasionally. But when she does hate a uniform, she really does hate it. And you've got to be on your guard all day because you might get attacked by this woman or anything, you just don't know. Well, is prison an answer for them, do you feel? I think prison is a deterrent to some people, to some people who, who maybe needed to go out and commit a crime, for maybe stealing food from the supermarket, if she's got children, she's got the husband's gone off, maybe with another woman. This, I think that there should be more help regarding the welfare people outside, because you get 
maybe one in ten here who are a real genuine case. But the rest of them, they come back, go out, come back again, go out again, come back again. And they still say, I'm not coming back, miss, but the week, a few weeks later, they're back in again. There's, they've got no, um, they've got no security outside. We're their security. They, we are their friends. Lunchtime at Holloway and the long trolley tracks from the outside kitchens, the women inside with time to wait. Like Connie, regularly sentenced on drink charges, Holloway is home. Many women prisoners can spend 18 hours a day locked in their cells. Yeah, you sit here and uh, you get to the stage where you could scream or, you know, you could put your windows out if you were that sort of person, you know, but I'm able to get over this to a certain extent because I can read. But a lot of people that can't do this, you know, a lot of people can't sit for any length of time and read a book. Well, this morning there was a girl in, in one of her cells, yeah. or, or rooms as you call yeah. And she screamed. Yes. Like I've never heard screaming. Yes. And she screamed louder and longer, and she yes. screamed and screamed and screamed. Yes. Yes. Well, is, is this is this uncommon? Um, no, it isn't uncommon. But then you you've also got to realise too that a lot of people that come in here are not um, what is the word? They're not mental or anything like this. That they're perhaps a bit unstable, and and basically they should be in a hospital. But what did you expect prison to be like? I mean, to put it bluntly, you broke the law. Yes. You were sent here. Well, I would, uh, I would think, you know, that I, if you come to prison, you don't expect it to be easy. And I would think that there should be work provided for you where you do a good eight hours work a day, you know, and a job that is producing something. You know, I don't see why there couldn't be some sort of industry in prison, not just because of men, but for the women where they could be doing a real job of work that would be benefiting something outside. Do you know what I mean? What you're doing here is benefiting nobody. But you're here. Yes, I'm here. And you've been described as a persistent criminal. Yes, all this, I've done that. But this, they always say this, that anybody that uh, does more than one sentence 
is always described as a persistent criminal. But you ask them to interpret what that means, you know? I mean, a persistent person is somebody that com commits the same thing time and time again. I don't, you know? So somebody that is a persistent criminal, to my way of thinking, has got to be somebody that spends their life in an out of prison. And I haven't spent my life in an out of prison. How long are you going to do this time? What is your sentence? I'm not doing a sentence, I'm on remand. Well, you've been convicted? No, I'm just an ordinary straight remand. You've been to court? No, no, I'm waiting to go to court. But how long have you been in Holloway now? Eight months. Eight months? Yes, without waiting, a sentence? yes, waiting to go for trial. And without a court appearance? I went to magistrate's court. You, you have to go to magistrate's court anyway. And then I was committed for trial. I elected to go for trial this time. And you've been waiting eight months for that trial? I came in the beginning of May. Why have you been waiting all that time? Well, they say that there is a backlog of cases to be heard, um, and they're just not getting on with them fast enough, so you just have to wait. But the morning you went to court, and you were not convicted, you were not sentenced to return to Holloway. Suppose mm. you were acquitted. Yes. What about these months? Then? Nothing. Nothing at all. Nothing happens at all. You just lose it. You don't get anything for, you know... Compensation? No, nothing at all. No. But it's not your fault that the court can't take your case. Oh, no, it isn't my fault, no. But nevertheless, you still don't get any compensation. I've never heard of anybody getting it. Prison rule number nine. The Secretary of State may, subject to any conditions he thinks fit, permit a woman prisoner to have her baby in prison and everything necessary for the baby's maintenance and care may be provided there. Jean's marriage had broken up and she feared her husband was going to take their child away from her so she decided to show him she meant business. Hers could be called a crime of passion. She went to his art gallery and set fire to it. Then she rang the police, told them what she'd done and waited. I pleaded guilty on a technicality but I was guilty. I was guilty as to what I did. I did commit a criminal offence. And so I pleaded guilty because I was guilty. But guilty in the sense of sin I meant. I'm guilty in the sense of action, that I do it, yes. But I don't feel the sense of sin because I feel the end motive was committed not out of, like most kinds, out of hate or greed, but from love. What do you feel your friends and family will feel about this kind of thinking? I don't feel, I know from all the letters I've had, all phrase like, we're right behind you. And things like, sorry if I feel a bit emotional, but if I do feel it. Like, we didn't know this was going on, and things like that. And if only you told us, and so forth. You know how people always say it's too late. Sorry. So, it isn't how I feel, or think they feel. I know they feel. They put it in writing. Marvellous letters, I've heard. They lost their mind. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, earthbound mutual friends of my ex-husband and myself have come, absolutely plumped down. 
what do you feel it will be like for you when you leave Holloway and go back to return to those circles? I think it'll be wonderful because I think all my terrible problems will be ironed out. It's sometimes said that when a woman comes to prison, so much responsibility is taken away from her, so much is done for her, that her life is easier than that of, say, the average housewife outside. You have a strong feeling that this is a chance to take a sabbatical, but not as a vegetable, but to have your house in order on stock taking for when you go out. What do you mean your house in order? What, what are you able to... I mean that you want to go out to find that your apartment has been let or carefully let to the right tenant or your various affairs you may be in, um, going in for uh, taking care of. Or, well, I, for instance, for what it's worth, I'm in the throes of having sold a little plot of land in Ireland and want to buy and exchange another, and that's got to be thought of. And I enjoy, uh, of course, you're not allowed to carry on any business as such in prison. You can't find any documents, I suppose, for obvious reasons. But I enjoy keeping my sort of finger on the part of the sort of umbilical cord of the outside world, apart from having a natural interest in what my affairs are going on. But also, I want to feel I can take up when I, when I left off when I do go out. There seems to be an easy relationship between the prisoners uh, and the officers. How, what was your experience when you, know, when you decided to start to speak to them in the first place? Well, it's very tentative, of course, because you see fiction and the films and things, filled with dramas of the, the rotten screws and the faded and so forth. So I was very tentative, you know. But um, then I, I, one becomes more and more involved, and you realize that they're human. And uh, I, I think the relationship is sort of normal. I think one wants to, I think perhaps one wants to guard against leaning over backwards and being too civil in case they think you're what, well, I can't use it in, in television, uh, because it's a rather rude word. But it, it means, uh, in schoolboy parlance, it would mean sort of sucking up to or carrying favour. Because people who have a, it again, the officers, think, now what does she want if they hear you say good morning to one? Why in Red Holloway, what are your earnings here? How much can you earn? Well, I pay super tax in here. I earn four and six. I pay a penny a week tax. So I only get four and five. But I have to budget very carefully. How does the budgeting work out? Well, we have to buy shampoo, which is five pence. I don't smoke, thank goodness, which is a great relief. But I love chocolate. I wish something good. We have to buy our letters, which are five pence stamped, you see. We're only limited to two letters a week. Toothpaste and shampoo, I said that, and soap. Unless you lose prison soap, but it's, you know, pretty rough. Otherwise, we can buy chocolate, cigarettes, or order Christmas cards, which we've done this weekend. But the four and five, who goes? Or Coco, you see, that's one and six, and so forth. You know, we pay ordinary retail prices, of course, you know. What would your weekly spending be outside before you came here? On average. Well, there's my, well, I bought my flat, but there's a ground rent and rates, and my housekeeper's wages, because I work, and I need a housekeeper to look after things when I'm not there. Telephone, lighting, entertaining, I have to do a fair amount of drink and food. About hundred pounds a week, I suppose. It's a round figure, but about that. Often more if I've had to give a party or something. Well, would you feel it is that has hit you harder coming into prison than a lot of the women, some of whom say that it's better in here oh, than it has? Well, yes, I'm sure, probably, because, I mean, not everyone can say they get two squarish meals a day. Never mind the niceties of a little scotch and soda in the party or anything like that, or electric blankets and so forth. Yes, indeed, it has, because you see, you don't, it's also cliche, you don't miss it until it's gone. You know, things one takes for granted. How do you mean? Like, as I say, the housekeeper makes my bed. I haven't made my bed since I was at school and I'm 48 now, so you work that for now. You know, I don't mind making my bed, but what I've never done before in my life is scrub a floor. I've now paced it out, we don't have uh, measures. But on the landing, just outside where we are now, and the other side, is 300 yards one side, 300 yards the other side, and 10 yards each end. I can't get out, there's six, 620, isn't it, yards of stone, I scrub. With good old Dickensian scrubbing brush, I mean, none of your nice electric polishes or anything like that, or dirty or not, if you can find it. So the equipment, you see, It'll be just dandy. I don't fancy that housekeepers' chances of future employment because I'm going to be so 
such a dab at it myself. When it comes to only plugging in a hoover over a fitted carpet, I just could not get to know the luxury of doing my own housework, can I? <laughs> well, I mean it. Well, I don't know. It's just, it's just, there you are. You just don't know, do you? <laughs> I should be a very good navigator, then, too, of course. Do you feel in any way that it's been a waste of taxpayers' money sending you here? Yes. Yes, I do. Complete waste of taxpayers' money. Actually, it's, 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 it's a serious waste of taxpayers' money. It's very unconstructed. It's a waste of taxpayers' money sending anybody in here. Prison rule number 27. A prisoner not engaged in outdoor work or detained in an open prison shall be given exercise in the open air for not less than one hour in all each day, if weather permits. charge of the security and care of the women in Holloway, the governor, Mrs. Dorothy Wing. It wasn't until I came to Holloway that I felt that, I felt strongly, that women could be so superior to men. And I get that picture here. They seem to be able to run their lives better inside a prison than men do. And I would like to know what you feel is the difference between men and women in this respect. Well, I'm no expert on men, but I do know that women respond to things being explained to them and understanding why it's necessary for them to do it, and then they will behave in a reasonable fashion. But if you started barking short, sharp orders at them, I think they would immediately become extremely rebellious. I would, certainly, and I don't see why they shouldn't. And even in prison, you wouldn't impose these conditions? No. They are still women who need to be helped, and there must be a certain amount of organization, obviously. But uh, not just barking orders. So the women in Holloway uh, no longer wear uniform. They wear their own clothes. Yes. And they also wear makeup. Yes. 
Has this sort of thing helped? It certainly helped. They've been wearing their own clothes now for over two years. And it makes them feel more individuals, and it also helps us, because the type of clothes that a woman wears is revealing in itself. The fact that we let them put up almost any pictures they like in their rooms also gives us a picture of them. It's pleasant for them, but it helps us too. of a deterrent to crime, do you think, prison is? What, today, here? None. None. No. None at all. I have heard women say this. I have heard a first offender say to me that she's uh, doing a six-month... Well, she's finished the sentence, she's gone out, and she told me I mean, two or three days before she went out that this had not deterred her from coming back. I've had enough. You always come to the end of the road, you know, when you think, well, this is a sickness and it's not going to happen to me again. If I see something that I want and I haven't got the money, well, I'll probably go in and put a deposit on it and ask them to save it for me until I can pay for it. If I could get quick money and know that I wouldn't get caught for it, I would do it. Because, I mean, let's face it, Everybody breaks the law. Well, it doesn't break the law, but they bend it, don't they? I might... I might just be tempted if somebody said there's a bank robbery to be done and there's 30 or 40 grand in it for you. How about it? I think about it then and I think, well, next time I get caught, I'm going to get 10 years. Then I think, well, maybe then. But I doubt it. I've gained in, in, in the sensible sense. Yes, I've gained. I hope I'm gaining from the experience, but I've also gained an awful lot of knowledge, which I hope I shall never put to use. I could be, if I had, uh, if I was younger and had the looks and the energy, I could be a very go-ahead call girl. But I don't think I'd get in here, because I know how to stay out, I hope. Although, mind you, the tips are being given me by the wrong people, because they're the ones here, aren't they? So perhaps I'm not as clever as I am, or they think they are. I could also, I think, have a pretty good go at shoplifting. I know how to sew the pockets in the inside of my coat and so forth. I've learned other things not connected with crime, like how to split a match to make one match light two cigarettes at an hour's interval, you know, with a pin, it's done. It's very tricky, you know, it takes some learning. Also, I don't smoke, but I've learned it just for fun, you know. Might help if there's a war or something, I come in use. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. 
8.15 p.m., the day is over. Oh, 